time to introduce you to our keynote speaker. We are very glad to have you here, Fabio Vitali from University. Thank you very much for being uh, uh, available today under the, these circumstances. So this was planned uh, very differently and we would love to have you here in Venice, but I mean, there, Bologna is not too far away and we will uh, find uh, another occasion to bring you here also. So. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Fabio Vitale is Professor of Information Computer Science and Engineering uh, in Bologna, at the University of Bologna. Uh, he's also teaching in the, the uh, Master Program, Digital Humanities and Digital Culture, so, which is a very successful program, and I have to say, we looked very cl uh, cl create an, uh, a similar, or at least uh, a similarly attractive program here in Venice. Uh, and uh, this is organized by Francesca um, uh, Tomasi, which was very supportive also with uh, any, any questions here. And uh, Fabio Vitali is involved in that program as an, uh, uh, as an informatic. Um, Bologna is also the university that awarded him its PhD in computer and law in 1994. And ever since, uh, he developed an extremely wide range of research interests and activities, uh, countless projects, uh, publications, presentations uh, are focusing on topics such as interaction between human and computer, hypertextuality and markup uh, in theory and in practice, uh, semantic web versioning of electronic documents, especially regarding collaborative work on uh, HTML and XML documents, uh, standards of documentation in the software process, including visualization, and last but not least, digital cultural heritage. Um, I'm out of date, but that doesn't matter. So everyone knows you very, very well uh, uh, as a, a very committed and a member of the Italian Association for Digital Humanities. Uh, you are a prominent uh, intellectual at the intersection of informatics, humanities, and digital culture. And uh, you have inspired uh, and supervised the work of many brilliant colleagues uh, and friends active today in the field of digital humanities. And your talk today, uh, uh, with a wonderful title, so one provocative statement and a simple but very demanding question, uh, is uh, a neutral point of view uh, considered harmful? Uh, can we make digital... So that is a very excellent question uh, uh, for a summer school or a summer camp uh, on digital and public humanities, exactly uh, what this should be about. So thank you very much, Fabio Vitali. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, very good. Very well. So thank you for having me, Franz. It has been uh, a long uh, semester of uh, news going and, and, and coming about whether we could make it uh, in person or not. I'm glad to be able to, to, to present in front of you. Uh, I'm too bad I'm not able to meet you in person. I definitely wish I'll be able to meet you sometime in the future. Uh, my presentation was meant to be um, provocative uh, and uh, also I am pers perfectly aware that I'm throwing myself in the cage of the lions, you being the lions, because uh, uh, this will not be a speech, a talk uh, very much in uh, terms of computer science topics and so on. And I will make uh, uh, examples uh, uh, for literature, for history, and for arts that you will be destroying me about because I will be overstepping my boundaries and throwing myself again in things I know nothing about. And uh, you will be uh, very happy to throw my ways and my errors uh, very rapidly. So, yes, first of all, though, an explanation on the, on the title of the of the speech, uh, X Considered Harmful is basically a standard title in computer science uh, uh, papers. It started with a 1968 paper by computer scientist Isa Dijkstra called Go To Consider Harmful. And it was a very important and very meaningful paper that made, uh, 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 created a, a full uh, uh, generation of uh, subsequent papers that have the Consider Harmful 
um, um, words inside, including a Ted Nelson, Theodor Nelson, the father of the hypertext, a uh, very important paper called Embedded Markup Considered Harmful, which was uh, uh, very well read in the, in the XML uh, and the TEI uh, um, uh, community. And then there has been, uh, including, so computer scientists like to joke about uh, their own jokes, so go to consider harmful, consider harmful, and even go to consider harmful, consider harmful, consider harmful, as uh, uh, papers that were presented on the consider harmful uh, line of presentation. And of course, NPOV means neutral point of view. It's one of the basic and most important uh, 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 item of the ph philosophy of Wikipedia. Uh, as being the uh, desire to describe rather than to engage in dispute. Uh, so the idea is that ideally the uh, um, page of a Wikipedia page, as any encyclopedia, should only uh, 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 describe the disagreements rather than uh, um, take part and take a side on it. So the idea that there, there is uh, the neutrality as a, 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 a possible uh, position to stand from when uh, examining and describing things. And uh, it is my statement and it is my basic point of view and the thing I'm trying to uh, convey to this audience that the neutral point of view is intrinsically not dangerous, not impossible, but basically, and that's the point, boring and uninteresting. So, a quick question to uh, you as an audience. How many entries in the top 100 world's most visited websites are cultural heritage sites? I'll give you the answer, it's easy. Let's, well, the world is very wide. The Americans are not uh, very interested in culture and so on. So let's restrict it a little bit. How many entries in the top 100 Europe's most visited websites are cultural heritage sites? Still zero. So apparently cultural heritage is not considered interesting. How can we make cultural heritage more interesting? The answer I'm giving it you, uh, I'm giving it to you right now is by abandoning neutrality and making it more interesting through the addition of what we do consider interesting in our cultural life without giving up on rigor. So I'm going to talk to you about neutral point of view as the source of boredom by about uh, the make making it uh, interesting by embracing conflicts instead of hiding them by uh, uh, telling you about uh, a complicated story is about european european records and how the ontologies uh, can help us maintaining rigor by uh, expressing and and supporting conflicts uh, some problems in metadata, provenance and confidence some tools and models, these are meant optional because uh, I will not have time to describe them in full, probably just to mm, briefly mention them because this will be a very long presentation and I'm late already, and some reflection and conclusions for the future. So we started reflecting on this topic uh, in October last year at the Time Machine Conference, which was a very boring conference in which everybody agreed on mostly everything. And when everybody agrees on mostly everything, everybody starts uh, yawning and says, oh, yeah, yeah, right, you're right, you're right, and, and nothing really happens. On the very last event, uh, a round table, on the very last round table of the conference, we had a speech by Marinos Ioannides, the UNESCO Chair of Digital Cultural Heritage, talking about the 1687 bombing of the Acropol by Athens, in Athens, by the Italian general Morozini, spelled with a Z. And he said, not only ISIS uh, burned down in important monuments uh, of cultural heritage, but also the Italians did in 1687, they bombed the, uh, the, 
the Parthenon in Athens, and they even created a commemorative coin of the event because they were so proud of that. I was sitting at the time next to a lady, a professor in Venice, a professor of Venetian history that was starting to boil and was sitting more and more nervously the more this guy was talking about this event and at some point she couldn't stand this anymore and stood up and said you have everything wrong everything you said was wrong it was not morosini it was morosini with a desk he was not italian he was venetian and venetia the venetian republic was not the italian republic it was a different thing and the commemorative, it was not a coin, it was a medal, it was not Venetian nor Italian, it was actually by the French kingdom two centuries later, meant to uh, uh, commemorate a different thing, the, the winning of the Christian culture over the, uh, the Turks, because at the time Athens was held by the Turkish uh, uh, Empire, and basically the Turkish hid in the Parthenon the whole stock of their uh, uh, um, ex explosives uh, 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 and everything. So basically, Morosini had to bomb it because that was the main artillery magazine of the Turk uh, uh, army. And General Morosini was crying when he gave uh, the order to bomb the Parthenon. And the bombing actually caused the end of the war with the Turks and therefore saved an incredible number of lives. lives. So. What is this trying to say is that suddenly an extremely boring conference in which everybody was agreeing with everybody else became an incredibly interesting and lively source of discussion and facts and uh, debates and uh, interest in actually studying the, uh, uh, the, the, the facts and the nature of an incredibly old war happening between two countries that do not exist anymore, nonetheless, uh, uh, because of what happened. So it was a story about cultural heritage items, the, the medal or the coin. It was a story about historical events shown by uh, cultural heritage items. It was a story about different reconstruction of the historical events. It was a story about interesting people because both uh, uh, Ioannides and uh, uh, Doritrinus are extremely interesting and cultural people and competent people talking about this different destruction of an historical event. It was a, a story about interesting people discussing because this is what makes stories interesting. So, what makes history stories interesting? Plot lines, prose, dialogues, characters, but mostly challenges and conflicts. And this is what's wrong in today's cultural heritage uh, collections and databases. Neutral point of view does not, does not exist. Neutrality does not exist. Encyclopedias do not really stimulate neutral point of view. They stimulate single points of view, the minimum amount of agreeable information in which every part of the, uh, uh, every party of the discussion can agree to have it represented. A single text for every item they show requires to eliminate or sterilize every conflict. Conflicts are placed somewhere else or removed or rendered harmless by some fair and balanced representation that remove any interesting and dramatical value in the representation. It's single point of view, not neutral point of view. So another example, oh, this, I, I'm already convinced this was the wrong example because when I create, when I made this example to my computer science students, nobody could answer, but I know that you will be able to answer about this thing. It's about seven painting, paintings held by the same museum, made by the same author, more or less in the same, um, in the same uh, period, one of which is fairly more uh, famous than the others and my computer science students couldn't recognize any one of them except for the last but I'm sure you will be able to recognize all of them right from the beginning this one this one this one this one this one can you recognize them 
Well, you may be recognizing this one. Uh, it's called Mona Lisa or La Gioconda in, in Italian, and it's uh, fairly more famous. It was actually for a long time just another well-known painting by one of the most fam famous painters of the Renaissance, not particularly appreciated uh, with respect to the other paintings by Leonardo. It was, you know, well-known, well-studied, normal. Uh, like everybody else that Leonardo painted. But then it, critics started in the, in the 19th century to consider it as a ma masterpiece, but otherwise it was pretty much ignored until in 1911 it was stolen by an Italian called Vincenzo Perugia, brought to Italy, to F Florence, hidden, found, denounced, and returned to Paris in 1913. After this event that had nothing to do with the artistic quality of the painting, nor the topics, nor the anything about the paintings or Leonardo in itself, after that, it became so famous to be representing the very nature and the idea in everybody about what a painting is. And if you ask everybody throughout the world, regardless of culture and so on, what do they think when they think about a painting? 90% of them will mention the Mona Lisa. So the Mona Lisa has become the idea we have of a painting, not because of the Mona Lisa, not because of Leonardo, but because of the action of Vincenzo Perugia, who created an interesting story out of that and made it rememberable and uh, uh, famous because of this event. So lack of conflicts is not the only problem. Conflicts in the humanities is natural and obvious and normal. It's part of the daily life of every scholar working in the humanities. You have very few facts. The number of facts you're dealing with in your daily activities is extremely limited. You have points of view, opinions, and sometimes conjectures maybe wild guesses and so on. This is what we are actually, you are actually dealing with on your daily life. And multiplicity of opinions is the norm, not the exception. This is what you are actually dealing with in your daily life. And you are actually started probably, most of you, certainly it happened for me. We all start our passion towards our discipline out of the deep study of a conflict, of a dispute. This is what is drawing us to our discipline, not things that are already settled, known and agreed upon, but the things we really do not like. We can consider ourselves as Sherlock Holmes, as Indiana Jones, as people that are here to solve uh, uh, mysteries and uh, find a, a final word on some dispute, on some disagreements. We are not custodians, we are investigators and explorators. To summarize, conflicts is what we were drawn in our, uh, uh, in our field. Conflict is what makes facts interesting. Conflicts is what makes facts easy to remember and recall. And conflicts are exactly the things we strive to re uh, remove from our encyclopedia, from our collections of data, from our uh, metadata collections in our digitized representation of things and so on, in order to provide our readers a harmless, sterilized, boring rendition of what most of us agree on our heritage. I think there is something to worry about this. So, embrace the conflicts and fight the simplicity. Fight the computer scientists you are surrounded by, because computer scientists do not like complexity, do not like multiplicity of opinions. They like only one right way to represent things. You give me the right way and let me do my job and represent it correctly. This is what computer scientists like. The idea that there exist two different opinions on the same thing is something that put the average computer scientist in deep troubles because it means that he has to accept the idea that there is something that is not settled, that is not known, that is not agreed upon, that is not nice. So let me give you another example. 
I started with that in 2012. So you know what Europeana is. Europeana is a big collection of um, uh, records collected and uh, uh, received from uh, many different sources. This in particular is a record uh, from, um, uh, in this case, uh, it's a print by Giovanni Battista Piranesi, 1720-1778, taken from a book called the Antiquità Romane and representing, of course, the Colosseum. Uh, this is the number of the default set of uh, metadata that the Europeana website, coming from uh, the uh, photo uh, archive from Marburg in Germany, had about this item. This is taken in November. Uh, this year's uh, representation is pretty much similar, but in 2012 there was also a different, so this is the old description, the old page from uh, uh, 2012. But there was another record of exactly the same item that is now disappeared that contains a number of additional information. It says that basically this is uh, an amphitheater dated 7080. So basically the object being described is the Colosseum. And in the description it says that the place of this item is in Rome. The photos is dated 1916-1970s by Corrad Helbig, Co uh, an extract from Le Antichità Romane, a work by Giambattista Piranesi, 1720-1778. Okay, big complicated. So the first record says that the title is, sorry for my German, Die Römischen Artertümer Vertes Giambattista Piranesi, and so on and on. While the other says that the title is the Amphitratum Flavium Colosseum. The first record says this is a print. The second, this is a building. The, the author is Giovanni Battista Piranesi, 1756-1787, 53 by 41 centimeters. And the subject is James Caulfield, or Charmont, and Gustav III, King of Sweden, provenance, Photomarbor. The other says that uh, the provenance is Wilder Kiev, Photomarburg. The place is Rome. The, there is a photo, 1960, Conrad Helbig. Content of photo, veduto dell'amphitheater Flavio, detto il Colosseo, and so on and on. So, we have two completely different descriptions of exactly the same item. A lot of details have disappeared. The second, the duplicate record have been deleted. Wrong information has been removed. This is not, of course, a depiction of the Colosseum in any sort of uh, uh, fantasy. This is not the Colosseum, of course. It's a print. Uh, 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 an 18th century print of the Colosseum. Uh, potentially useful information has been removed. The Corrad Helbig thing has been removed. Imprecise information has been kept. It says that the subject is still James Colfield and Gustav III, King of Sweden. This is still now. Most of the description have been deleted, and what is left is extremely boring. Later reflection. So, one is a print, the other is Piranesi, like, dated 1756. Otherwise, it's a building, dated 1780, via a photo by Corrad Helbig and print by Giovanni Battista Piranesi. Interestingly, the second record, even though contains the largest number of errors, is actually uh, the most useful to actually reconstruct the full history of the thing. And now let me introduce you to uh, oh, no, sorry, so a few more remaining doubts. So what is, are we digitizing and preserving to posterity? Is it a building, the digital version of the building? Is it a print by Piranesi? Is it a photo by Corrad Helbig? And what is the role, the, rep, uh, the uh, um, corresponding roles of the table 37, uh, 37 and the full work in four volumes titled Antiquità Romane? What happens in 1787, considering that the print is 1756, and why somebody wanted to put to, 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 to record the, this date. And what is the role of James Caulfield and Gustav III, King of Sweden, considering that they clearly are not the subject of the print? A better story. So, at the end of the 20th century, the Marburg Photo Archive organized a retrospective of the works of Conrad Helbig, a famous German photographer and art historian known for the early pictures in black and white of the uh, uh, classical Italian territory, as well as his fancy for 
naked, tanned Sicilian boys of the 50s uh, represented in many different uh, uh, positions and poses. Among the pictures they selected, there was this one, which is 30, uh, 53 by 41 centimeters of the Piranesi Colosseum. What is Piranesi Colosseum? It is a single specific print within a book in four volumes called Antiquità Romane by Giambattista Piranesi, high quality etching of sceneries of Rome and its countryside of the period. This was an extremely famous book. It was the kind of book that the noble, the young noble coming back from the grand tour in Italy would buy and bring back to his parents to show that they actually spent their money fruitfully and learned a lot of things. So there, has, there are hundreds of copies of this book around uh, the uh, noble families in Europe. The first edition of the book was dedicated to James Caulfield, Lord Salmont, which was a 27-year-old patron of arts in his third year of the Grand Tour in Italy. When uh, Giovanni Battista Piranesi died, his son Francesco tried to make up for uh, the money for a new edition of the book and found a help in King Gustav III of Sweden, which was 10 when the first edition of the book was published. So certainly it was not the kind of people that Giovanni Battista Piranesi could dedicate the book to, but was an adult and a patron of arts when the new edition, the 1787 edition of the book was printed. So uh, Francesco Piranesi actually did, decided to dedicate the book to both of them. And the digitization description of the photos by Conrad Helbig were in care of Marie Louise Gundlach the director of Marburg Archives uh, of the 20th century photo collection between 1995 and 2000. So what? Why are we interesting? Because we need to put everything in context. For instance, Sergio Mattarelli is the president of the Republic is a false, false sentence unless we add a number of contexts that make it true. For instance, Sergio Mattarella is the president of the Republic in Italy between the year 2015 and 2022. So by placing it in a specific context, temporal as well as uh, geographical or special or uh, uh, jurisdictional, we turn a false sentence into a true sentence. And these contexts are extremely important because they provide the framework within which an arbitrary sentence can become truthful. So there are several, I'm not going into that, I'm giving you a few examples. Uh, temporal and spatial relationship, I already shown you. Let me give you an example for part, whole and object subject. First of all, what are we describing? So this thing here is not the Colosseum. This thing here is not the print by Giovanni Battista Piranesi. This print here, this thing here is a JPEG downgrade that I created last year of a high resolution scan of the end of the 20th century by someone at the Photomarbarg archive of a picture, a photo dated 1956 by Conrad Helbig, of a print of 1756 by Giovanni Battista Piranesi of a building called Amphitheatrum Flavium or Colosseum. Uh, created by Vespasiano in 72 uh, uh, Anno So, if we do not explicitly uh, uh, um, describe the full sequences of subject ob object things we are discussing, we end up with a lot of complications. For instance, the 43 by 52 centimeters is clearly not a measure of the uh, building Colosseum because. Built. It's clearly not uh, uh, the measures of the print because it's 12 by 10 centimeters in the original book. It's the dimensions of the photo by Conrad Helbig. So again, what are we associating the information to? That's extremely important. Second, if we do not express things exactly in terms of the relationships, uh, that belongs to relationships, that's very hard. What we are representing here is a single print of a book. And the dedication is not of the print, but of the whole book of James Caulfield and Gustav III King of Sweden, just like the picture belongs to the Photomarburg archive. 
And in Eagles have stories, Fabio Vitale, Conrad Helbig, Germano Vincenzo Piranesi, Vespasian, James Caulfield, Gustav III. They are all people that have stories behind them that are interesting to record and know about. So what? Well, representing these things is hard because archivals, archivists, librarians, and museum curators do not like to specify things they are not uh, really sure about. Uh, Franz, I will be a few minutes late. I still have a lot of material. Fine, so please continue. It's so exciting. Okay. You have all the time you need. <laughs> Thank you. So, when you are working with uh, 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 scholars in the humanities, they really do not like to put down in paper or in their database things they are really not sure about. And computer scientists do not like to create things about uh, opinions. Uh, they like facts. They like uh, uh, statements whose truth level is not questionable. But there is very few things that we are sure of and can be represented as facts. So, what do you do when you cannot represent all you know about uh, as facts? You end up making statements that uh, uh, are just about the few things that you that you know. And therefore, we have these problems, reticence, coercion, and dumping. Any tool that does not address these issues will generate bad data. So what is reticence? The idea that you restrain from making statements that would be interesting. So this is the 12, uh, 2012 uh, version of the document. This is the 2019 version. And you see a lot of information have been removed because someone didn't feel confident of the truth level of these things. So we end up removing a lot of information because we repent about the fact that we actually put it. Next, coercion. When you force some information that does not really belong there into. So, okay, James Caulfield and Gustav King of, the, of Sweden are not the subject of this print, but uh, the author of the, of the uh, metadata wanted to put them in subject because therefore they could connect it to uh, the database of uh, uh, individuals that couldn't find a place anywhere else. Not only that, uh, they decided to put it in a specific um, table of the full volume because the full volume doesn't exist in the database of the, uh, uh, the, the European and the uh, 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 Marburg archive. So you want to put something, there is no specific field you can put it on, so you just force it somewhere else, and hopefully uh, uh, people will read it and understand it uh, in some way. And dumping is when you uh, have a, a remaining bunch of things you want to say about the, about the items you are describing, and there is no specific field to put it there, and so you dump it somewhere. For instance, in the description field, uh, that in both cases, had a lot of information, the date of the photo, the author of the photo, and so on and on. Basically, everything you put in the description will be lost by search engines because it's not structured in any way that the search engine can find. So are, they become immediately pointless and useless information just there to uh, uh, increase the weight of the record, but not to help the, uh, the, the scholars. Similar problems in the model of metadata, temporal, geographical, and jurisdictional vagueness. Talk about Morosini. Was he Italian or Venetian? That's important. Uh, Cristoforo Colombo, is he Italian or Genovese? But the, the people that uh, paid for the, for the expedition were the Spanish. So it is important, probably so, it is important to be able to express the vagueness of the fact that Venetia was not Italian and so on. Lack of provenance, you have no single point of view, no way to specify the confidence you have, so that you must assume maximum confidence, so there is no room for hypotheses, conjectures, and wild guesses, and basically, you end up only putting in your metadata the things you are pretty much sure about, and you end up with an extremely dry and limited and, and uh, uh, short set of information and you create boring metadata that do not tell any history, any story. No, I'm going fast. But 
So, let's back to the history I, I gave you before about this uh, Colosseum thing by, by Piranesi. Let's try to make some sources and reliability of this statement. So, there are a few facts that we are sure of. The dimension of the pictures, the position within the book, these are facts that we are sure of. And if we dispute on this, it means that either me or you has made an error. These are well-grounded hypotheses that uh, are most probably true and probably there will be no great discussion about. And this is also interesting. So, uh, Giambattista Piranesi created a book called Gian Le Antichità Romane. It's in four volumes, high quality uh, uh, etchings and so on. And the book was dedicated to James Caulfield, Lord Charmont and so on. These are conjectures with some level of likelihood. Um, Conrad Helbig was famous for uh, 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 his pictures of uh, work of art and uh, Sicilian boys. And uh, uh, the book by Giambattista Piranesi was important because it was one of the major uh, uh, um, souvenir by the, uh, of the Grand Tour by the nobles. And then there are totally invented facts that I completely created out of nothing such as the fact that uh, uh, Marie-Louise, uh, whatever his name, was the director of uh, the photo collection in Marlborough Archive, or that at the end of this 20th century uh, organized a retrospective, and so on. All these are completely different statements that on the outside and for the uh, non-expert seem exactly identical to each other. So, how can we work with this? How can we put rigor, scientific rigor, together with the fact that we want both safe and established facts as well as conjectures, uh, opinions, hypotheses, and even wild guesses and inventions. Well, consider this list of items. Some are true, true some are speculative, some were completely invented. But consider now this. Fabio Vitali states here that he is certain that the picture is 53 by 41 centimeter. Fabio Vitali states here that he is fairly certain that the 1756 book was dedicated to Lord Charmont. Fabio Vitali states here that possibly the 1787 book was dedicated to King Gustav III of Sweden. Fabio Vitali states here that one possible event is that at the end of 20th century, the Marburg Photo Archive organized a retrospective about Conrad Helbig. Fabio Vitali states here that he is imagining that this description of the photo were in care of Marie-Louise Gundlach an employee of the Marburg Archive. What is the difference between the left column and the right column? Is that the left column, truth value, is open and completely depending, dependent on uh, the knowledge that we have about the things. But the right column only contains completely true sentences. In the first uh, meaning of the term, means that disputing them means that somebody, either me or the person making the dispute, is making a tangible error by adding the provenance, who is saying what, where, and the confidence level of the statement. We are turning all types of statements from an open set of statements that may or may not be true into a set of true statements that can be fed into a computer system, that can be given to computer scientists that do not like uncertainty, and say, these are true statements. So, by stating who is providing a statement and what level of confidence we are giving to the statement, we have turned these things into manageable bits that can be expressed formally. Ontologies are exactly there to express these kind of things, that can induce the domain expert to safely express more than the few established facts about the things they are saying. You can say things that you know about, that you suspect about, that you feel or think about easily and safely in a safe way by specifying that you are not completely confident about them easily. And that these statements can coexist with totally inconsistent and contrary statement by somebody else, or even by yourself with a different confidence level. And then you can start to debate these things and create the interesting history out of them and create back into the metadata 
the kind of interesting level of discussions that make up for the reasons we started in our respective fields. Not only that, we can make sure that these things can be found, understood, and even searched explicitly for the level of the disagreements so that we can look for, for instance, find the greatest disagreements inside the collection as easily as it is possible right now to find for all the works by Giovanni Battista Piranesi or all the works of the 18th century and so on. Storytelling is interesting because it makes for uh, interesting story that can be remembered, that can raise the interest in your audience about your interest. Data is not interesting. Stories is interesting for humans. But context-free storytelling is not scientifically acceptable. We have to source our sentences. We need the infrastructure, specifically the ontological infrastructure, to allow for sourcing and assessing confidence on stories without constraining our data to a single accepted and boring story. How? There are several things that we can work with. The side of CRM, you've probably been discussing the, throughout the week because this is the most important kind of ontology to express things and facts about our cultural heritage, but also the type of temporal notation that, that CIDOC CRM provides is uh, limited on uh, specific uh, 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 or very vague and not particularly computable uh, representation of uh, temporal uh, dates or intervals. And then the provenance ontology right now used to represent the provenance of the items and not the provenance of the interpretation of the items. So right now it's only used in an extremely limited way, while if we were able to use the provenance also to associate the statement itself to a specific person, individual, and moment in time, that would allow for the coexistence of competing interpretation over the same pieces of data. The historical context ontology that can connect bits together in order to create complex description of facts that contains disagreements and competing opinions and competing representation of facts and the confidence information ontology that allow you to associate confidence level both of the author itself i believe 90 percent or i believe that uh, 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 franz fischer uh, made this assertion uh, wrongly uh, and so on uh, so that you can allow to represent formally the level of agreement or disagreement or craziness that exists within your database in order to clearly layer uh, uh, the authoritativeness of your uh, database. So now I'm going to a con conclusion because you don't, do not want to hear about uh, everything specifically, but it, it's here for your information if you want to know about them. Reaching some conclusions, 15 minutes late, sorry for that. I do think there is something wrong in having fun reading about commemorative medals to the siege of Athens by the Venetians in 1687. And I think there is something immoral about having fun about black and white photos of prints of an 18th century book. But I had fun. I had fun, I found myself in the role of Sherlock Holmes. I'm not sure at all about the certainty and the correctness of the things I stated, but it makes sense. And it clearly created much more interesting stories about these items and put me in the right mind to know about things, to learn about things I would have never dreamt anywhere in my life I would be interested in knowing about. So it does not matter if the narratives are about the object themselves, some contemporary events, or the anecdotes arising out of some discussions. The events at the uh, Time Machine Conference last uh, October were interesting because of some objects and not about the same objects. So it is important that interesting characters, interesting challenges and conflicts end up in our databases, end up in our metadata, because it is important that we are able to tell interesting stories about our objects. And these stories need to be 
told with scientific rigor and carefully scholarly analysis of sources and tradition. If this is done, it may be wrong and immoral, but we end up with a lot of interesting things that help us understand and uh, enjoy our cultural heritage much better. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Fabio Vitali. This was a, a great uh, closing keynote. I think uh, this gives a lot of uh, material to debate on. So please make yourself comfortable outside your comfort zone. Uh, and uh, yeah, it looks like the, the, the perfect closing on, on the text trend. I just have an addition to make to our participant of the text trend. There's a third attribute and the responsibility attribute, which you can use on, uh, on almost every element to, uh, to give uh, the level of certainty and the responsibility of any statement. So the TI is very much suitable to uh, further develop your proposal here, Fabio. Um, and yeah, the floor is open for, for discussion now. I think we should uh, take at least 10 minutes, 15 minutes to give room for questions, suggestions uh, on your attack on the greatest achievement of uh, the World Wide Web, which is the uh, neutral point of view. And maybe one point you said, no cultural heritage site is among the 100 uh, uh, most visited site. What about Wikipedia itself? So I think it's the most visited site in the world, and yes. I consider it uh, a cultural heritage website. It's secondary source, not primary source, but yes, I agree. Okay, in this regard, okay. But it's also uh, um, providing lots of materials uh, of primary um, level. Okay, just a remark. The floor is open. So you can raise your voice or uh, uh, post into the chat if you want to say something or um, type uh, your question into the chat and I can read it or I can give you then uh, uh, the, the voice to uh, elaborate on your question if it's a little bit complicated. But please be short uh, so we have the opportunity to have uh, some, some more questions also to the others. So we have you, you managed to include all the four strands. So history, art history, textual scholarship, and uh, uh, archaeology. Mm. It was about the Colosseum. Tiziana. Ah, no. Oh, Tiziana says Federico and Gaia have questions. So uh, Federico. And then Gaia, please. Yeah. So thank you very much uh, for oh, yeah. this excellent uh, do, do you understand me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. For for this uh, excellent presentation, uh, because uh, it is very important uh, to uh, work uh, on uh, these uh, levels uh, of uh, of uh, certainty and so on. And my consideration is uh, that uh, when we work on interdisciplinarity, okay, we should uh, take into account uh, the traditions of studies, okay, and uh, we should uh, uh, study not uh, the best practices uh, in digital humanities, but the best practices uh, in the humanities on one hand, and the best practices uh, in uh, the computer science on the other hand, and uh, the best practices uh, in uh, logics, mathematics, and so on, because for example, uh, uh, the uh, modeling, no modeling, uh, um, uh, what you show in uh, your presentation uh, is uh, uh, enhanced, uh, for example, by the knowledge of uh, of uh, uh, epistemic and doxastic uh, uh, logics. Uh, no, so logics uh, that uh, have an higher order than the logics that usually are applied in uh, the naive uh, no or uh, simple uh, 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 digital humanities okay so what what i mean is that when you um, when we we apply some standards okay we risk to apply something that is uh, very uh, uh, simplified okay on the contrary well, we must go always beyond the standards 
and uh, we must have a part that is standardized, but another part that is not the uh, standardized just because it will become the standard of the next uh, uh, generation of scholars, okay? So uh, standards, unfortunately, in the last times are just cages in uh, uh, which are no able to move. So uh, I guess that is important to have this interdisciplinarity, okay, that uh, put together the the um, the disciplines at the state of the art in the original disciplines so i i i am always scared when we go there and we want to teach to the others our best practices no i guess that this isn't a, a good idea and uh, so i am very provocative because i want to provocate uh, some uh, reactions by you and also by the, the public <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, very briefly, I knew when I started this discussion that I would be throwing myself in the cage of lions. I was perfectly aware that, uh, and I made it for the fun because I'm far away from you, so you're not able to harm me physically. But uh, of course, uh, yes, I totally agree that I overstepped my boundaries and uh, that uh, uh, as a computer scientist, I shouldn't be allowed to uh, uh, teach you how to do your own uh, uh, your own uh, um, business, your own uh, uh, job. But uh, uh, this came from, on the other hand, my deep knowledge of the heart and the minds of computer scientists and how they will systematically try to simplify and reduce every complexity you will propose to them into the, a minimum set of uh, 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 acceptable and uh, uh, reliable uh, ways to represent things. So, unless you go to computer scientists and tell them, we want to represent complexity, you will not obtain complexity. This is just a suggestion to you to deal with computer scientists. We have a question from Gaia and then followed by Daniel and then uh, another question or several questions by Seren Moret. Oh, Gaia first. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. It was really thought provoking. Um, I don't know if this is provocative as well, but I I had the impression that there was a huge elephant in the room in your speech, which is the political dimension, because you raise a lot of issues about moral ethics and even epistemology and all the technologies that we can adopt to uh, address these issues but i do believe that in everything you say uh you said there is um a political dimension meaning but just at the beginning when you started thinking about conflict and the way in which conflict is uh, very often um silenced or um uh, excluded from debates uh in the neutral point of view uh, approach um it came to my mind uh, a very good article that i read a few years ago uh by the booming uh the um, bolognese uh, collective of um, italian writers and uh i i've always found it very interesting because what they say in two words is that um the difference between right and left in politics is uh in how we address conflict meaning that generally speaking left-wing politicians uh, acknowledge that there is conflict within society uh, whereas right-wing politicians try and um, externalize that sort of conflict meaning there is cohesion and coherence within society and the conflict is between us as a society and what is outside us so the other societies uh, which gives rise to nationalism and so on so i do believe that in everything you said starting from these um what you said about flicks but also uh, on authority and also uh, on the ground of you know how we um because today, when we think about how the technologies are affecting our social and political life, uh, we do need to confront ourselves with the fact that many people are voting 
uh, inspired by fake news and so on. So that is an epistemological, but also a political issue. Um, and there is a very complex um, dynamics going on between the fact that we do need authorities. We do need people that have uh, a wider knowledge than we do have that can guide us in forming our opinion about stuff. But at the same time, in, you know, sort of an ideal world, everybody would be able to form himself or herself uh, an opinion about stuff. So the balance should be in finding a way to make everybody able to uh, develop some ideas. Uh, and so going against authority. But on the other hand, uh, we have seen recently that what happens when you sort of try and destroy all kind of authority, meaning that when people believe that even though they read something on a web page with absolutely uh, no trust and no, um, no, uh, yeah, no uh, authority, they can debate with people who have studied and dealt in very great depth with such issues. So I do believe that um, even though we do not want to, uh, sometimes we are reluctant and we are reticent. And I, I saw some sort of reticence in your speech about this uh, in addressing that all of all that you said is also very political. I mean, that is what I believe. I don't know if I made myself clear in any way. Thank you. Wow. Do you have three hours uh, for my answer? Um... Yes, uh, true, uh, guilty as, as, as charged, um, of course. Uh, uh, what I try to, and I'm still explicitly trying to uh, represent my ideas, is as narrative tools to make things, cultural things, more interesting. Of course, this means that uh, 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 of course, my political ideas come into play in that, and the fact that I do not believe that there is a, 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 an objective interpretation and a truth, uh, inter a true interpretation of anything, especially about things that have passed and do not exist anymore. But again, uh, the the whole point of my discussion is that, regardless of the political dimension of the thing a story is more interesting than a list of facts. And on this, so this is the Hollywood point of view, not the uh, political point of view of making things and making culture more approachable by the uh, general citizenship. Not only that, what I'm trying to express, and this has a political value, I think, is to say that there is a way that current digitization of news, of facts and so on, do not use, that allow both the representation of fringe ideas at the same time as allowing a majority of uh, opinions to form and be expressed and be used as a guidance for the evaluation of the truthfulness of any ideas. The problem of fake news that we are listening so far is that there is no simple way for the authorities to express their opinions and for these opinions to be shown side by side in the same screenful where the fake news is shown. So it's the simplicity of the ontological model that we are using to share and access to our news that created the fake news phenomenon in the first place. We do not have uh, provenance, we do not have confidence, we do not have the coexistence in the same place of uh, uh, um, uh, different uh, po opinions and points of view. And this is the problems that I see from my technical point of view in the uh, arising of the fake news phenomenon in the, in the current world. Did I answer to you? Daniel Kiss, yes. please be very short. Okay. Um, thank you for this uh, fascinating talk. Actually, I took up the challenge and I think I made a, another small correction to the, to the notes on, on the Piranesi print in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. 
turns out that Lord in British peerage, it's a title, it's a form of address, like Mr. So Lord Charlemont was actually James Caulfield, fourth Viscount of Charlemont, and he became later, I think, uh, uh, Earl Charlemont or whatever. Um, um, my, um, in that case, I found that information using Google. So this is a digitally retrieved piece of additional knowledge. But uh, it was I who asked this question, who is this person? And then I, I found the conflicting bits of information. And, and I concluded that probably the more correct form is for Viscount Charlemont. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this is the kind of dialogue that I, I lack in digital humanities. So I find that digital humanities today has this new positivistic bent. We produce and we manage, administer enormous amounts of data. And but when it comes to reasoning, to debating, to analyzing uh, that data, um, we uh, there is a black hole. And you surely know the book of uh, Lorenzo Tomassi in L'impronta digitale, who who launches actually an attack on digital humanities. He says that digital humanities does not exist. And I don't ag agree with Tomassi, but. Uh, uh, I think that there is a real weakness there, and I think your proposals um, go some way towards rem remedy, make, providing a remedy. But I, I would want to see more debate and more more analysis of information, and and perhaps less new pos less positivism. Uh, is there a question in there? Because uh, again, uh, I, I, I uh, the, the, my ob objection to positivism. Positivisms was actually a starting point from uh, from which I started for my uh, 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 identification of what is technically needed to create a, uh, a complex but sophisticated and rigorous way to represent uh, debates. Exactly out of that, yes. But uh, uh, I think we should uh, give room also not to to some. A final question from uh, other participants. Serge Noiret, you have uh, several questions here, a very, very practical question, and then about the strategy, if you want to elaborate briefly on your question here to the plenum. We can't hear you. Otherwise, I can read it. Okay, so uh, Serge is asking, uh, how would you translate research uh, hypothesis, uh, or you can read it also in the chat, into searchable interoperable meta metadata? So if you're looking uh, critically looking in, into, into the data. Um, oh. That's the first part. <laughs> first of all, um, there are two levels here. One is the specific statements, and the other is the contextualization of this statement in terms of provenance and confidence and uh, all the other contexts. So basically, first of all, of course, you have to have a domain ontology, otherwise of an open free text representation of your uh, 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 um, hypothesis or wild guess or whatever. This is like the, the basic proof you are, uh, you are uh, establishing. The next step is, of course, assigning to it a provenance. So who is making this statement, when and where, and the confidence level that the author itself, himself, uh, herself, assigns to the statement so that basically you can say uh, I think that this is the most likely uh, uh, um, explanation for this phenomenon but this could also be a possible explanation and this could also be a possible explanation so you are keeping all three possible explanations alive in the same sentence with of course different levels of confidence that you yourself have the next step where the uh, discussion arises is in how my community and the other scholars react to my statement and they themselves assign a confidence level and possible objections and competing explanations for the same phenomenon and therefore themselves they place 
uh, a confidence level on their own assertion and your assertions. And from then on, we can start discussing about the discussion and create a complex uh, network of assessments in which who says what and what confidence level he or she is assigning to what he is saying can be computed and used to uh, determine the overall likely likelihood of each competing statement about the same thing. This can be done both on a specific ontologically precise statement within a domain ontology or over plain text sentences uh, uh, that say something. Diego, do you, do you want to read your question? Oh, yes, it is a very uh, short one. Thank you very much. Great talk. Uh, the fact that the um, uh, cultural website like Europeana, Public Museum and so on are public funded, they are public bodies, European money and so on, did this influence the way that uh, they are designed and the uh, neutral, non-conflicting uh, quality of the data presented in it? Mm, it could be, I have no idea. What I'm wondering is, uh, Europeana is not a, a, a database, a collection of metadata, is a collector of uh, uh, European uh, collections. So uh, uh, Europeana itself has no point of view on anything except on the metadata model he is, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, suggesting and enforcing. And this metadata model uh, by default uh, uh, inhibits and uh, reduces the number of uh, competing points of view over the same uh, uh, um, cultural heritage items. So basically Europeana uh, 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 seeks, uh, seeks to obtain a single point of view over our cultural heritage, but I think that it's more uh, out of the seek to uh, obtain simplicity for the uh, the operators rather than uh, as a political or a, a cultural uh, uh, idea of that. So yes, uh, Europeana uh, forces and or, or, or pushes towards a single point of view, but because of trying to make things simpler for the uh, the, the collections. I think that uh, uh, scholars in uh, uh, computer uh, usability should work should work to create the necessary interface to help the scholars, the, the humanists, express their knowledges and their complexities in an easy way. And this is still completely undone, not done. Thank you. We uh, exceeded our time frame uh, uh, quite a lot, but that's uh, your fault, Fabio, uh, and I'm very glad we we uh, we had to because there was so much ground to you covered and uh, so much things to uh, to think about and um, discuss. So thank you very much for this, indeed, uh, Fabio Vitali. Um, this was uh, really fascinating and uh, a suitable closing keynote for a full week of a lot of inspiration and uh, discussions. Uh, on digital and public humanities and our responsibilities as humanists engaging with cultural heritage and the society. So if there are no f existential questions, fundamental questions, crazy questions we uh, need to address or should uh, um, dis discuss now, I would like to close this uh, summer camp. Thank you very much to our guest speakers, to our participants, to the organizers, to the team of the center, also to administration who did a great job in organizing the originally planned summer school, which we had to cancel. So this is really a sad thing. It was a lot of work and then we had to cancel this and uh, um, reorganize. So we actually organized two events, but I think it was really worthwhile. And uh, we are very glad that you uh, uh, attended this, this summer school, uh, summer camp. And uh, we hope to see you in Venice or on conferences or other virtual meetings uh, as soon as possible. And uh, yeah, Fabio, last words are yours. Just want to know, do you want my slides? Is there the Absolutely, absolutely. 
Okay. Yeah. So all our materials from all strands, as far as possible, will be provided freely online. Uh, also, the video of this uh, um, presentation today, and also the discussion, including the chat. So, if there are no personal uh, uh, things, but what we we always do a, a little edit of this. Uh, this will all be. Uh, you can find this on our website, uh, and yeah. So you can go back to all the details that you are most interested in and uh, use this material for your in, in, in your future okay thank you thank you for okay. listening thank you very much everybody uh, uh, have a good weekend enjoy the weekend do crazy things and uh, yeah